I was slow one morning, and my father went without me to take the yaks to new pasture. By the time I started, it was beginning to snow, so I found my father's tracks right away. Then, a few miles later, I saw him on the path right ahead of me. He was starting to cross a bridge over the little stream at the pasture's edge. His shoulders were hunched, and he was leaning into the storm. The snow was coming thick and hard by then, so I couldn't see him very well but I thought I saw my father sit down in the shelter of a big rock. So I ran there. I could hear heavy panting and thought he must be very tired. But when I got around the rock, I found it wasn't my father I'd been following. It was a yeti. I'd never been more scared. I fled back to the village, and my mother called in a monk to say prayers so that I wouldn't get sick. It's very bad luck to see a yeti. When we think of sightings of cryptids or the paranormal, we usually think of the blurry and shaky camera footage that we often see on YouTube and other sites. Skeptics are quick to say that they provide little to no evidence, or that it's simply a misidentification. But when indigenous people claim to have seen the animal firsthand, the claims are more difficult to silence. Welcome to the Hidden Creatures podcast. Join me, Edward James, as I watch the weird, search the strange, capture creatures, and this week we look yet again at the Yeti. This is the second half of our two-part episode on the Yeti, so if you haven't listened to the first section, then I suggest you go back and listen to that. If you like the podcast, then leaving a review on iTunes is a great way to help. It'll mean that more people will be able to see the podcast, and if enough people start listening, I'd love to be able to make it a weekly occurrence. Also, don't forget to subscribe so that the show automatically downloads when a new episode is released. Anyway, on with the podcast. So, in the last episode, we were able to find out about the creature itself, some of the local lore, the early documented sightings, and some evidence offered to prove the existence of the creature. In this episode, we'll look at even more evidence that is said to prove the animal exists, the variations of the Yeti, the Zute and the Mite, and the many possible explanations that people have put forward to suggest why the creature might not exist. When we walk down the street, stepping on nothing but man-made concrete, it's near impossible to track where someone has been. But as soon as we start to walk on more natural terrain, we start to leave clues behind. To most of us, these clues are invisible, or at least unnoticeable. But to the trained eye, trackers can see where we've stepped. It could be flattened grass, perhaps sand and dirt being deposited on the top of dead leaves, a broken branch, or even the gentle outline of a footprint. Sometimes, you don't need to be a tracker to spot these clues, as respected mountaineer Steve Berry found out in 2014 as he hiked in Bhutan. He'd been travelling for days in the Himalayas on the northern border of Bhutan when his Bhutanese mountain guide cast his eyes over an impassable crevasse and saw a strange row of footprints, much larger than that of a human. The prints were about 200 metres away on the slopes of Gangar Puensum, the world's highest unclimbed mountain. Knowing the possible importance of the sighting, he lifted his video camera and recorded evidence of the prints. On this footage, we can clearly see large footprints in a single line, one print directly in front of the other. He noted this fact as he was trying to figure out which animal could have made the prints, and recognised that these prints were different to many he'd seen on his travels. Firstly, he discounted them being human as his guide told him that they were the first people to ever trek this way, so he began to think of other large animals in the area. Bears and snow leopards would be the only two animals large enough to leave prints of this size. But he knew that due to them being four-legged, their prints are offset, two off to the left and two to the right. But these prints were alternately one directly in front of the other. This led him to one conclusion. A biped must have been responsible for the prints. The only large biped thought to live in this region? The Yeti. 
It took three more days to hike back to the nearest small hamlet, a group of four houses, where he started speaking to the locals. He played the footage of the footprints to a local person who immediately recognised them, and said, yes, these are Migu tracks. Migu being the local word for Yeti. Not only could he recognise them as Yeti tracks, but said he knew they were because they put one foot directly in front of the other. Steve Berry, so shocked that his hypothesis was essentially confirmed, almost fell over. The local man went on to say that he had actually seen the Yeti just over 10 years ago, and said, It was about 100 metres away, standing upright with its arms by its side and stared directly at me. It was completely covered in long, dun brown coloured hair, and its face was covered in hair like that of a cat or dog, but of human height. For Steve Berry, this was enough to suggest to him that there was a large biped roaming the Himalayas, whilst others said that without taking a close look at the prints, we wouldn't know what caused them. Much like the footprint spotted by Edmund Hillary in the first half of this episode, people have argued that the snowmelt on the edge of the prints can make them look much larger than they originally were, so could have been caused by a smaller creature. The problem was, even if Berry could reach the prints, all they would have been able to do would be to take photographic evidence which still might not prove what caused the prints. But this was not the case in 1951, when expedition leader Eric Shipton found what is to some the best evidence for proving the Yeti's existence. On November the 8th, at approximately 4pm, Eric Shipton's expedition team of 15 discovered, documented and photographed the most famous Yeti prints found. The find was made at the end of the expedition when Eric Shipton Michael Ward and Sen Tensing were exploring in an area called Gauri Sankar, to the southwest of Everest. The cryptozoology website Cryptomundo gives an in-depth account of the discovery and cites Eric Shipton's biography, Eric Shipton, Everest and Beyond, to describe the images, and I think that the description is the best way of imagining what the images show without visiting the Hidden Creatures Instagram, at Hidden Creatures Show, to see them for yourself. Peter Steele, the biographer, writes, Shipton took photographs of Ward standing beside the tracks. Lower down, they were more distinct with sharply defined edges, 12 inches long by 5 wide. A big rounded toe projected slightly to one side and the second toe was separate, and the lateral three toes were smaller and grouped together. To give an idea of scale, Shipton photographed his ice axe and Ward's boot beside one of the prints, which appear to have been made in the last day or so. Ward, even now, says the footprints were absolutely as Shipton described them. Ward thinks that several footprints might have been superimposed on each other, as might be made by men walking in a single file. With the footprints being overlaid, not only was one yeti in the area, but a social group. Shipton spoke to the Times newspaper where he said that some of the prints were far too distorted and melted to be counted as evidence, but went on to say where the snow covering the ice was thin, they discovered the preserved imprint of an animal's foot. Sen Tinseng, one of the Sherpa guides, had no doubt what animal left the marks, and he was sure they were tracks of the Yeti. Sen Tinseng was not new to stories of the Yeti. It was part of his culture, but also two years prior, he and a group of Sherpas had seen a yeti from 20 metres. Shipton went on to say that they could clearly make out where the animal had leapt over a crevasse and used its toes to get more grip in the icy conditions. If Ward was correct and the footprints were caused by mountain boots, these toe prints wouldn't be present. They followed these footprints for over a mile until they reached an area covered in large boulders and lost the track. When two of the other explorers followed a few days later, the tracks had become almost destroyed by melting, showing just how fresh they must have been when Shipton discovered them. Even with the snow melt, the following explorers still knew that they had discovered something very important. One member, Tom Bordillon, even wrote back to his family saying, the abominable snowman is not a myth. There were about a mile of tracks set 18 inches apart and staggered, the pads were 8 inches by 10 inches and he probably walks on two legs. 
There were impressions of the front pads where the beast had jumped a crevasse and scrambled on landing. Bordillon and his team followed the footprints and were impressed by the animal's good sense of terrain as it took the correct mountaineering path. To me, the fact the creature walked the path that would have been taught to mountaineers did make me wonder if they were actually following the path led by explorers in front of them. But a letter Bordillon wrote, with accompanying photographs, begins to settle these doubts. He wrote, What it is, I don't know, but I am quite clear that there is no animal known to live in the Himalayas that is that big. Compare the depths to which it and Mike Ward, no featherweight, have broken into the snow. The eyewitness testimony from this group holds a lot more weight to many in the cryptozoology field, as their combined knowledge of the area, the animals and the snow meant they could forge well-formed theories. Shipton found the sharpest and most detailed footprint in the area and took photographs to document their finding, even implementing a scientific method by having an object in frame so that an accurate size could be established. The images are so sharp that in the years following, people were able to create plaster casts of what the imprint looks like, and they certainly don't look like bear tracks. The plaster casts created give cryptozoologists a wonderful 3D object to see and hold. But it's important to remember that these casts were created from just the images and not made on site. However, casts have been taken from prints in the ground, which give us a true reading of what the prints look like. The most famous Yeti cast was made on site by Tom Slick on an expedition in the Himalayas in 1957, six years after Shipton had found his prints. Slick had sponsored three expeditions to the area, and on the expedition in question, where the expedition leader was Peter Byrne, both Slick and Byrne discovered prints. After a long expedition with no evidence found, Slick and Byrne decided to split their team into two to cover a larger area. Tom Slick was in the Arancola Valley when he discovered a few prints in the mud. His team were at a height of over three and a half thousand metres, and the prints discovered are rare in comparison to most other Yeti prints. Most prints found in snow will have had their edges melted, or the shape might have shifted or changed in the weather and wind, whereas in hard, cold mud, the print had held firmly. Slick, knowing the importance of the discovery, made a plaster cast of the print so that others could examine it. The print had similarities to the one Shipton found. It was squarish, 25 centimetres long, 18 centimetres wide, and as with the Shipton print, many in the field studied it. The answer? It's unique, but we don't know what it is. The prints found by Byrne were more like the traditional Yeti prints found in snow. They had chosen a mountain that they thought could possibly be a home to a Yeti-like animal, and upon exploring, discovered a line of prints. Unable to take a plaster cast of the snowy print, Byrne reached for a camera and captured the print on film. The photography shows two footprints, one possible Yeti print, and one much smaller human print, and an ice axe to show scale. The Sherpas with Byrne claimed it couldn't have been a bear print, as there were no claw marks. With such exciting evidence found on the expedition, Slick and Byrne arranged more expeditions, with not just the hopes to see a yeti, but to capture one alive. It was on this expedition, whilst sharing a bottle of scotch with a thirsty Sherpa, when Byrne heard a piece of news that could possibly settle the argument once and for all. The Sherpa had told Byrne that there was a local monastery that had in its possession a yeti scalp and the hand of a yeti. The story they told was that a monk from the monastery, many years ago, went to a cave to meditate, but was unable to, because a yeti was using it as a nest. Years later, the monk returned to the cave, and the yeti was dead. Knowing the superstitions of luck surrounding the yeti, he collected the scalp and hand and brought it back on the long journey back to the monastery. The monks let Byrne see the scalp and hand, which was under lock and key, and he was so excited by the discovery, he asked if he could take it away to be studied further. Unfortunately, the monk said he was unable to take it away as it was bad luck for the hand not to be within the walls of the monastery. So he left, empty-handed.
Sorry about that one. Heading back to England, Peter Byrne came up with a plan. On an expedition in 1959, he asked to see the hand again, but this time he had something up his sleeve. Byrne made sure to ply the monk with whiskey so that when he was painstakingly slowly looking at the hand, he would fall asleep. When asleep, Byrne did something morally ambiguous. He removed a finger from the hand and replaced it with a human finger bone that he'd brought with him. With the monk still deep in slumber, he began to subtly wire the finger back to the hand and rewrapped it as he'd found it and left. Knowing that on an expedition the bones could become easily damaged and that airport security isn't the biggest fan of stolen yeti bones in your hand luggage, he had to develop a further plan. Firstly, they were smuggled out of Nepal and into India. In India, they hid the bones in plain sight. Oscar-nominated actor James Stewart, star of It's a Wonderful Life and Vertigo, was waiting to pick up the package. Then, hiding the bones in his luggage, he headed back to England, safe in the knowledge that no one would suspect him of a crime. In 1991, it was discovered that an American anthropologist named George Agogino had kept a small tissue sample from the hand when it was in his possession in an envelope in his desk. During the NBC programme Unsolved Mysteries, they obtained the samples and sent them off for tests. Whilst many thought the results would come back as bear, monkey or human, they weren't ready for what they'd hear. All that could be proved was the tissue sample was near human. With such astonishing news, people wanted to test more samples from the Pangbosh hand, but it had been stolen from the monastery and has vanished from history. With the results being returned as near human, we should wonder what or who the hand came from. Could it be that the sample was contaminated in the years it spent in Agogino's desk? Was the DNA too degraded? Or could there be another explanation? Up to as soon as 100,000 years ago, an animal lived in the area that is now known to be the largest ape that ever lived, Gigantopithecus. From the fossils we've found, we know it stood up to 3 metres tall and weighed up to 540 kilograms. Its legs were bowed and relatively short, with long arms that could hang down past its knees. We currently don't know if the animal walked on two or four legs, as no hip bones have been found. Perhaps the hand came from an ape-like creature that lived high up in the mountains out of the reach of science. After all, humans and apes share 96% of their DNA. Could that be described as near human? Gigantopithecus has two known subspecies, the larger Gigantopithecus blacki and the smaller Gigantopithecus giganteus, which has led some researchers to think that the yeti, the large zute, and the smaller mite could be evolutions of these large apes. Before I start discussing the possible explanations of what some claim the yeti could be, I think this would be a good time to discuss two lesser known subspecies of yeti. The Mite, the smaller of the two, is usually described as about the size of a young man, but much heavier built. Like the Yeti, it's covered in a reddish or brown fur, but has longer hair on its head. Some sightings claim the male of the species have a long mane around the shoulders. Although the Mite is the smallest of the Yeti subspecies, it's said to be the most dangerous, being a carnivore and usually feeds on small rodents, small birds, and other small animals. The Sherpa myths say that its strength and ferocious nature has led to the deaths of people. The Dzute is much larger than the Mite, growing up to almost three meters, and although larger, is said to be an omnivore, an animal that eats both meat and vegetation. The animal has been sighted walking on two legs and using its long arms to help, much like a gorilla. Although the Dzute is said to be less dangerous to humans, it has been known to easily slay both yak and cattle. In stories, it is said to catch yak by the horns and using its huge hands, twists until it breaks the neck of the animal. With three distinct subspecies, categorised by different appearances, size and behaviour, 
there have been many explanations put forward to explain what people claim to be the cause of the stories. Homo sapiens, the scientific name for humans, first evolved in Africa about 200,000 years ago, and a small population headed north into Europe about 60,000 years ago. When they moved north, they encountered other early human species, Homo erectus and Neanderthal. It's often thought that two of the biggest reasons that Neanderthal died out and allowed Homo sapiens to become so widely spread was because of conflict and the increased competition for food and resources. From reconstructions of the Neanderthals from the skulls we've found, we can see the pronounced brow ridge and the more conical shape of the head. So perhaps, when they were losing a foothold in Europe, they moved to places that Homo sapiens found more difficult to populate. The mountains. In the mountains, maybe these wild men were the beginnings of myth. However, if they were to move to such a harsh environment, they would need to develop new skills quickly. There is evidence that there was a type of human existing in the mountains in areas that most would struggle. The Denisovan, an extinct species of human, was discovered in 2010 in the Denisova cave in the Altai Mountains in Siberia. The fragment of finger bone that was found was thick, which initially led them to assume it was from a male, but on further examination they discovered it was from a female, leading them to the conclusion that Denisovans had sturdy builds like that of Neanderthals. Denisovans had a genetic mutation which allowed them to survive at high altitudes, something the Yeti might also need. The mutation allows the blood to be thinner in low oxygen areas, and this mutation is today found in Tibetan Sherpas, which means Homo sapiens had interbred with Denisovans. It's now known that this genetic mutation leads to more successful pregnancies and is more common in Tibetans with darker and stronger facial features. In a study, DNA was taken from Tibetan Sherpas to try to establish when the interbreeding happened, and it was found that it most likely happened as late as 7,000 years ago. This gap of just 250 generations could help us realise where the stories of the Yeti came from. When we think of interbreeding, we must make sure that we don't think of it as a romantic date night, candles, rose petals and getting lucky at the end of the night, more like something violent you might see on a David Attenborough documentary. With the possibilities of stories being told of aggression, rape and kidnapping by strange hairy men in the mountains, could the Yeti just be a twisted folk memory that's become known worldwide? Well, the only problem is, a memory doesn't leave footprints or hair samples. So what could be leaving them? Professor Brian Sykes, who researches the Yeti and is mainly interested in finding whether or not there is an isolated surviving population of other human species, was given two suspected Yeti hair samples to test. And what he discovered is not known to science. After putting the hairs through the most rigorous tests available, he discovered the DNA matched that from an ancient polar bear that's thought to be extinct, that existed about 40,000 years ago. Whilst he doesn't think that these ancient polar bears are wandering the Himalayas, there could be a subspecies of brown bear in the high Himalayas, descended from an ancestor of this polar bear, and he goes on to say, or it could mean there has been a more recent hybridization between the brown bear and the descendant of an ancient polar bear. The Yeti could also have a much simpler answer. It could just be a misidentification of animals already known to science. The Channel 4 documentary, Yeti, Myth, Man or Beast, took an in-depth look at the DNA evidence of supposed Yeti fur and teeth. In each of the tests carried out, the DNA was either from a Himalayan brown bear, a Tibetan brown bear, and even a black bear. The Himalayan brown bear, known for its reddish-brown fur, stands just under two metres tall, and its track often looks like that of a human's, but this is due to it placing its rear paws into the front print. The Himalayan brown bear is the most likely explanation to many people, but even if it explains 99% of the sightings, does it explain all of them? Whether or not you believe in the Yeti, remember there is, and always has been, a beauty in the unknown.
into part two of the podcast where we take a look at an animal that was once a cryptid, but now has its place firmly in the science books. This week, the mountain gorilla. Yes, you heard me correctly, the mountain gorilla was a cryptid. For centuries, stories were told in East Africa about massive hairy creatures that would kidnap and eat humans, using their immense size and strength to defeat them. The animals were known to the indigenous people to exist, and each had a name for them, that translates into names like forest people, ape men or hairy men. The first record of someone from outside of tribes knowing about them came earlier than you might think, 500 BCE. An exploration had been set up, led by Hanno the Navigator, and they were astounded when they stumbled across huge hairy men. Hanno even wrote about the encounter in his journal, using the word gorillae, meaning hairy people. The accounts, all thought to be myth and folklore, meant that people were surprised when an English explorer began to speak of ape men who would visit his campfire at night. Stories of these hairy beasts would continue to be occasionally spoken about by Western explorers, but many of the accounts were assumed to be tall tales or exaggerations. It wasn't until 1902 that the mountain gorilla was proven to science. German officer Captain Robert von Beringe was in the Virunga region of Rwanda, East Africa, when he saw the huge ape and shot it. He brought the corpse back to Europe and it was classified as a new ape species. The mountain gorilla looks very similar to the already known western gorilla, although its hair is longer to help them live in colder temperatures. The males weigh on average 195 kilograms and when standing on their back legs can reach a height of one and a half meters. Although the myths about the gorilla's size were correct, their behavior is very different. They are in fact vegetarian and spend most of the day eating as they need to consume a huge amount of vegetation to survive, upwards of 34 kilograms of food each day. Due to how recently they were discovered, very little was known about the mountain gorilla until American biologist George Schaller began a 20-month observation in 1959. After this, he wrote two books, The Mountain Gorilla and The Year of the Gorilla, which described their social organization, behavior, and ecology. Adult males are known as silverbacks due to their short gray hair that covers their backs, each social group, known as a band or troop, is led by one dominant silverback, one subordinate silverback, usually related to the dominant, one or two blackbacks, three or four sexually active females, and upwards of six infants and juveniles. In stable social groups, severe aggression is rare, and they have generally been noted as gentle or shy, but if two bands of gorillas meet, the two silverbacks are sometimes known to fight to the death using their huge canines to leave deep wounds. Knowing how deadly wounds can be means that confrontations are more often resolved with threatening behaviour and displays. One behaviour that is unique to gorillas is their ritualised charge. The behaviour consists of nine steps and is meant to show dominance and scare away other males. The stages are progressively quickening hooting, symbolic feeding, rising bipedally, throwing vegetation, chest beating with cupped hands, a leg kick, sideways running four-legged, slapping and tearing vegetation, and then thumping the ground with palms. The most famous study into the mountain gorilla was carried out by Diane Fossey in an 18-year study that started in 1967. She made new observations, completed the first accurate census, and established active conservation practices such as anti-poaching patrols. The conservation practices are now more important than ever, as there are now less than 800 gorillas in the wild. Thankfully, organisations are campaigning to save the last gorillas from extinction. One group, the Gorilla Organisation, is at the forefront of conservation and have run award-winning projects tackling the challenges of habitat loss and poaching. If you want to see what the Gorilla Organisation does, check them out on their website, gorillas.org, where they provide lots of information and ways to support them. In this, the final section of the show, we take a look at the lighter side of cryptozoology, and in today's episode, we hear about the hot-headed naked ice borer. 
The hot-headed naked ice borer was first documented in the April issue of Discover magazine in 1995. They wrote that a wildlife biologist, April Pazzo, was in Antarctica studying penguins in a remote, rarely explored area along the coast of the Ross Sea when she noticed that penguins were behaving strangely, as if agitated. She was getting ready to release a penguin that she tagged when she heard a great deal of squawking. She looked up and saw the penguins waddling as fast as they could, a slow black and white stampede heading towards her. Wondering what could have been the cause, she moved through the hordes of penguins and found one that hadn't fled. Instead, it was sinking into the ice as if it had turned into quicksand. The ice under the penguin had melted and it was waist deep in slush. Helping the penguin, she grabbed it by the wings and pulled it free. However, it wasn't just the penguin she pulled free from the ice. Attached to the penguin was about a dozen small, hairless, mole-like creatures. Pazzo was able to capture one creature, but the rest let go and vanished into the slush. The creatures are about 15 centimetres long and have a bony plate on their foreheads. The average body temperature is about 110 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and the bony plate is covered in blood vessels which it uses to burrow through the ice and melt the ice under unsuspecting penguin, which they then consume with their sharp teeth. Pazzo's discovery might also give answers to what happened to the polar explorer Philippe Poisson, who disappeared in 1837. She says, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that a big pack of ice borers got him. I've seen what these things can do to emperor penguins. It isn't pretty, and emperors can be as much as four feet tall. Poisson was five foot six, so to the ice borers, he would have looked like a big penguin. People were amazed by the article, and many wrote into the magazine, which then published some of them. One letter from the Small Mammal Zoo and Discovery Center in San Francisco wrote, My staff and I were extremely excited to read about the hot-headed naked ice borers in your April issue. What an extraordinary creature! This would be a fantastic addition to our collection and would, incidentally, increase our membership at a time when, like all non-profit institutions, we are struggling to keep our heads above water, or perhaps, more appropriately, above the ice. Naturally, in the world of rare animals, it is the first institution to display the unusual that receives the most benefit. Therefore, in anticipation of being able to display these creatures, our board of directors has already approved an outlay of $2 million for the construction of a special area to house them. We would like to contact April Pazzo as soon as possible to receive from her a full description of the animal's habitat, food and recreational needs. In particular, we are hoping that the hot-headed naked ice borer can exist on something other than penguin. We had contacted the California Academy of Sciences in hopes of eliciting their cooperation on donating some of the weaker members of their penguin exhibit, but they were cool on the subject to say the least. Others thought the hot-headed naked ice borers could be used more constructively. One person wanted to order the borers to help him rid his driveway of snow and ice, but it was Jenny Gardner of Oregon who wrote this letter. The showman P.T. Barnum said a sucker is born every minute and I certainly would have been the next one if my husband hadn't been nearly as gullible. The article on Hothead certainly had me going, though. With a little help from co-workers, we deciphered April Pazzo as Italian for April Fool, and realised that the photo illustration was doctored. The question is, how many more of your articles were April Fool's jokes? Rats on Prozac, Mini Mammoth and Buddy System Birds all now appear to stretch reality beyond belief. Please sort out the truth from fiction for us, and I'm glad this only happens once a year. The Hidden Creatures podcast is written and produced by me, Edward James. If you want to get in touch with me, perhaps you want to suggest a cryptid, tell me about a sighting, or maybe want to order a pack of hot-headed naked ice borers, then visit the Instagram at Hidden Creatures Show. See you soon, and happy hunting. <laughs>